our mission statement here, love God, love others, and serve the world. And we'll be uh, going deeper and, and really giving the whys behind those statements and that. Well, listen, I got a joke for you guys. You ready, one? Four, one? All right, this is brand new. Probably never heard it. All right, heard about this guy. He was late for work. Third day in a row, his boss said sarcastically, okay, what's your excuse? And he said, I'm so sorry. My wife asked to drive me to work, and I told her she didn't need to, but she insisted and said she could be ready in 10 minutes. But then when we left, the drawbridge was stuck up, so I had to actually jump off the bridge, swim across the river, fight off all these alligators, and fortunately, a helicopter on the other side picked me up, uh, dropped me off at the top of our building, and ran down 60 flight of, chair, of, of, of stairs to get into your office. And his boss shook his head and said, do you really expect me to believe that? No woman can get dressed in 10 minutes. <laughs> All right. I hear the guys laughing, ladies not so much. So, But hey, we're going to wrap up our series, This Is Your Idea, by answering the question, how do I share my faith? And, and first off, I'm just very proud of those of you that asked that question, because the question is really not about you, it's not about us, but it's really about um, us reaching out to people around us. And that's the heart of God, because Jesus gave us this mandate in Matthew 16, 15. He said, Jesus said to his followers, go everywhere in the world and tell the good news to everyone everyone. And our heart here at COTC is to bring good news to, to people that they do not uh, have a relationship with God. And, and we're on a mission here to reach people. And you are one of two places with God today. You may be at the place where you're trying to find God and, and you're looking to, to find him and you need to have that relationship with him. I want you to know you could settle that before you leave here today. And here's the other thing that we need uh, the, the other side of it is, and maybe you are, you've crossed that line with Jesus Christ. You've given him your heart and that. Well, then you've become part of God's mission team. You've been part of his rescue, his search and rescue team to share the good news with what God's done in our lives with those around us. Because here's the bottom line is God loves lost people. And I don't know if you've ever lost one of your kids or not. I, you know, Karen and I have three grown uh, kids. And um, I can laugh now, but at one point or another, we've lost all of our kids when they were small. Anybody else? relate to that, okay? And uh, we can laugh now, but back then it wasn't very funny. And anytime you lose anything of any value, you don't like take an inventory of what you have and say, okay, well, I've got two, two out of the three kids left. I'm still batting over 500. Hey, babe, let's go ahead and get a burger and forget about the kid lost, okay? Nobody ever thinks that way. If you lose your car key, you don't say, well, at least I have my wallet, you're distracted by that which is lost. And I have to be honest with you, I had a Chevy Chase moment when I went on vacation this past summer. I lost Karen for a few minutes. And what happened is I'm one of these guys that I like to have our activities planned before we go on vacation. Not that we have everything planned out to a T, but I don't like to get on vacation and say, all right, what are we going to do and waste that time? I like to have it planned out. So I researched. We we're flying into Jackson Hole, Wyoming. We we're going to spend some time in Yellowstone. So I found on the Internet this um, um, company that would give you Jeep tour through uh, Yellowstone. But it was really cheap and sound too good to be true. So rather than book it on uh, the internet, I decided to wait till we got to Jackson Hole. And um, so we flew into Jackson Hole, picked up a rental car, and decided to go to the visitor center to ask them about the um, uh, organization, about the company that's offering these Jeep tours. So we get to the visitor center. I turned to Karen and said, would you like to uh, go in with me or do you want to stay here? She said, man, no, there's a beautiful view here. I'll just sit here. You run in. So I run in. I get some brochures. I talked to some of the people there. They said, man, avoid that company. So anyway, I walk out and I'm looking for a bluish green Honda CRV. I walk out there and cannot find a uh, bluish green CRV anywhere. I said, okay, well, maybe somebody asked Karen to move. Maybe she had a park in the next parking lot over. If that's the case, I'm sure she's inside looking for me. So I walked inside, and it's a pretty good visitor center. Walked through it, couldn't find Karen. So I walked back out looking for the CRV, bluish green. There is none. I start panicking. I'm running around the parking lot asking people and, and all, really kind of freaking some people out. I said, hey, did you see a CRV, bluish green? 
They said, no. I said, man, my wife's missing. I ran back inside, and there's a lady behind the counter. I said, hey, listen, my wife's missing. You need to call the sheriff. And she's kind of, kind of talking me off the cliff. And she said, well, maybe your wife went to get a Coke and uh, maybe went to run an errand. I said, you don't understand. I've been married to her 41 years. She would never do that. She would have told me first. And she said, okay, before we call the sheriff, Okay, tell me again what happened. I said, we flew into Jackson Hole. We went, we picked up a rent-a-car. Then I said, rent-a-car, white Toyota Camry. <laughs> Bluish green CRV, Tampa Airport. And I said, hold that call. I ran out, looked in the parking lot. Sure enough, Karen's sitting in a white Toyota Camry. So I ran back in. I told the lady, I said, I said you guys are going to have a lot of laughs on me. I found my wife. She's in a white rental car. She didn't know whether to laugh or cry. She gave me a high five. I walk out. I get in the car, and I lean over Karen. I said, I'm so glad you're uh, not kidnapped. And she's looking at me, acting weird. And she, the, the thing is, she saw me running around out in the parking lot. <laughs> And she said, what is he doing? But anyway, but no time. And so seriously, for five minutes, I thought my wife was kidnapped. But never did a thought cross my mind that, you know what? All right, well, I lost Karen, but at least I got the rest of the vacation to look forward to. Her loss and go on. I was distracted. And I want to say this, God is distracted with the loss. Because the Bible says that he would leave 99 to find that one that was lost. Why? Because he loves lost people. We love lost people. In 2 Corinthians 5, 20, he says, we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We are, we are here to represent Jesus. And the only Jesus people are going to see is through you and I. Again, going back to 2 Corinthians, I love this line. God is making an appeal to people through us. And we need to remind ourselves that we have the greatest news in the world. Man, our sins can be forgiven. We can have meaningful purpose in life. Man, we get a, a home in heaven waiting for us. And best of all, God becomes our friend. And what better news uh, than, than the message that God has given us? We've got the greatest message in the world but we have to earn the right to be able to share. We can't just run around to people that we don't know and, and share the story. Now, if God tells you to do that, that's one thing. That's usually the exception. But generally speaking, you just go out and just start talking to people randomly. They basically look at you in, our today, in today's culture and like look at you and say, man, what planet are you from? And unfortunately, a lot of times churches get into two extremes. We end up with two extremes. One is, one is extreme and pretty alarming with what's taking place in, in churches across America. They're saying, hey, man, let's just be as secular as the world. If we can't beat them, join them. Man, we need to change with the times. We need to be more inclusive. Let's change the Bible to fit into our culture. I want to say this. You cannot make a difference if you are not different. You do not have to compromise to make a difference. At the same time, the other extreme is you got some churches that are so dogmatic, so rude, so unattractive that nobody wants to be around them. So how can we stand up for truth and be attractive? Well, Colossians 3 says this, or Colossians 4 says this, be wise in the way you act with people who are not believers, making the most of every opportunity. When you talk, you should always be kind, and pleasant so you will be able to answer everyone in the way you should go. Then First Peter says this, but respect Christ as the holy Lord in your hearts. Hear, hear this. Always be ready to answer everyone who asks you to explain about the hope you have. I want you to get this. Catch this. This verse is making the assumption that you're living your life in such a way that people are looking at your life and say, man, there's something different about you. I want to know what, what, what you have. And let me just give you some very practical steps today to reach your friends. These are, these are steps that you can apply to your life immediately. And the first one is this, take initiative. Be proactive in building friendships with people. Don't wait for them to, to make their first move. You reach out to them. Everyone wants friends. 
but very few people know how to make friends. You go to a party, there's a whole bunch of strangers there. People are wanting to interact, but they don't know because they don't know how to make friends. They don't know how to reach out. They don't know how to take the initiative. The Bible tells us that you and I, for those of us that have given our lives to Jesus, the Bible says that we are ambassadors for Christ. That means we need to be proactive. We need to take the initiative. We need to make that first move towards our neighbor, towards our coworker, towards our family member. Today, so many people are afraid to be hurt, man. We live in a, a very skeptical time. People don't want to be conned. They don't want to be manipulated. They don't want to be used. And in order for us to build relationships and build friendships, we have to meet people halfway. I want to tell you, Jesus lived this out. A lot of people, a lot of times people want to correct first. Jesus connected first. Jesus was the great connector. And what was so great about his life is he never compromised the truth. And if you read the New Testament, you'll look at one of the things that will jump out to you about, about Jesus is sinners love to be around, uh, around uh, Jesus. And it wasn't because he was telling everybody around him, hey, guys, just live, live your life any way that you want. He was straight up front with those guys. But he had connected with them first. And we all have heard that, that people don't want to know what you know until they know that you care. And that's, and that's why this message isn't about how to win the argument. Because we could win the argument and we could lose the soul. It's not about being right. It's about being effective. So how do we be effective? Be proactive. Connect first before correcting. That's why we do the things that we do in the community to, to meet the needs of people. That's why a couple weeks ago we did a, a free pancake breakfast for our community here. That's why two weeks ago that we worked with Moody Elementary School to, aden to identify over 50 families that were in desperate need, and they came on our property. They were given everything from shoes, clothing, uh, uh, school, uh, backpack, and supplies. They were, they, we even provided them with a school picture in case they couldn't afford a picture at Moody Elementary School. We gave them turnkey for everything they need going into the school, school year. That's that's why last Saturday we did a big neighborhood outreach, a splashback party here on the property. That's why um, Monday and Tuesday we're in base, we're handing out backpacks and, and school supplies. That's why Larry's starting a college ministry on the campus uh, of the college. We do that not only to meet the needs of the people, but to connect with our community. Man, so that we can become that church. They may not even remember our name, but, but you know that church down 26th Street, that church with a big cross in the front of it? Man, that church, man, they love people. They love their community. I know we can go there because there's something different about those folks. You know, a beautiful example of Jesus connecting with people is found in the story of uh, Zacharias. He was a chief tax collector. Let me put it in terms that, that we could relate to today. He was a thief and he was a sleazy politician. He lived in today's culture. He could be running for the president of the United States. <laughs> But he wanted to see who Jesus was. He didn't want to know who Jesus, he didn't want to know what Jesus knew. He wanted to see who he is. And we all know the story. He couldn't see, a very short guy, he couldn't see over people's shoulders. So he found a tree, he climbed up in a sycamore tree. Jesus is walking through town, comes up under the tree, looks up at Zacchaeus. I say, Zacchaeus, you got to get right with God. You need to get saved. Well, Jesus didn't say that. Jesus said, Zacchaeus, come on down, man. I want to come to your house. I want to have dinner with you. What's he saying? He said, man, Jesus, uh, Zacchaeus, I want to spend a little time with you. I want to get into your world. And Zacchaeus came down and welcomed him gladly. Now, if you look at the religious leaders around him, what did they do? They started, you know, muttering. That's what the scripture says. They muttered. They were complaining. They were saying, you know what? Man, Jesus is a guest of sinners. We can't trust Jesus because he's a friend of sinners. You know, if people are going to criticize us as a church, let them criticize us for being friends of sinners because we want to be like Jesus. And now watch, Zacchaeus, after he has lunch with Jesus, he stands up. 
and he comes out. And we don't know what happened in that lunch because you and I weren't invited. But he, he gets up, he makes this announcement. He said, first off, I want to tell you, I'm giving half my possessions to the poor. Anybody I've ripped off, I'm going to pay them back four times. And you look at, man, we don't know what happened in that, in that lunch, but you know what? It had to be something powerful. It had to be something intimate, something very real. And you look at Jesus, he connected with people before correcting. And I'm telling you, all you have to do is co connect with people, add value, and love people, and watch what God won't do through you. Here's number two. You guys with me this morning? Yes, all right, here's number two. Share your story. Always look for an opportunity to share your story. Each one of us that have crossed that line, given our lives to Jesus, we have a, short, a story. Let me just give you a tip here. Don't tell people why they need to change. Nowhere in the scripture does it tell us that we need to point people's sins out, their shortcomings, and highlight and bring that to their attention. Actually, it says the very opposite. Matthew 5.16 says this, In the same way, you should be a light for other people. Live so that they will see the good things you do and praise your Father in heaven. And notice what you, you don't have to be perfect. All you have to do is, man, you have to be about, man, making your light shine and, and showing good deeds, being kind to people. And all of a sudden, what does Scripture say? People are going to sit up and take notice of you and just say, you know what? I want what you have. I mean, that's how I came to the Lord. And I'm not going to my testimony, but I just saw a friend of mine was radically changed in Cleveland. He was totally different. I did not know what happened to him. I remember sitting down with his pastor. I seriously, I just said, I don't know what happened to him, but I want to find out because I need that. And I'm just telling you, man, <clears throat> we live our life and God will do some cool things in our life. I think we'd all agree the world has lost its mind. Okay, stupidity has now is the rule of thumb in our culture and throughout the world. It's getting darker by the day. And I'm not trying to be negative here. I'm going to spin this the other way. As things are getting darker, I want to tell you, it's a great opportunity for the church to shine and for us as individual Christians to shine. We've got to look for an opportunity to, show, to share our story with, to share the good news. And that's really where the word witnessing comes from in the Bible. Although over the years, that's been kind of messed up. Witnessing is simply telling other people what we've seen and what we've experienced with God. You know, if you go into a courtroom, you have four players. You've got the judge, you've got the prosecutor, you've got the defense attorney, and you have a witness. You know what? The, the God doesn't ask us to be the judge. He doesn't ask us to be the prosecutor, and he certainly doesn't ask us to be the uh, defense attorney. We don't have to defend God. What does he ask us to do? He asks us to be the witness. We just simply tell people what we've seen God do in our lives. And if we do that, I want to tell you, man, that makes all the difference in the world. We need to learn. One of the things, you, as you look at Jesus' life, one of the things that he was a master at is he would ask questions. And I want to encourage you, learn to ask questions, because that's a, that's a way you can take relationships deep, deeper. It's very simple, but very profound, man. You could begin to ask people at work, hey, man, tell me about your family. Tell me what's going on with you. That neighbor, ask them, hey, what did you do over the summer? How did your vacation go? What did you guys do on vacation? And as you get to know people, the questions will become deeper. And if God wants you to share your story with them, he's going to give you the opportunity to do that. Now, the reason why most people don't want to get to that level of relationship with people, because they're afraid people are going to ask them questions that they don't know how to answer. And you know, when you look at the Bible, I think one of the best witnesses, best examples in this area is the blind man. I'm sure we all know the story. Jesus <clears throat> comes across this blind guy, picks up some dirt, he spits uh, and rubs the dirt together, becomes mud, rubs it in the guy's eyes. I would not encourage you to do this, but I'm just saying God got away with this, you know. But <clears throat> he does this, and he says, hey, go wash your eyes out down at the pond, and, and God heals him. He comes back. He said, man, I'm healed. His neighbors and those that knew him, you know, they're looking around and saying, man, is this the same guy? Some people said, yeah, that's the same guy. I say, man, there's no way that can be the guy. He steps in, and he said, hey, listen, that's me. Man, I'm the guy. I was blind. And they say, well, how in the world did you open your eyes? And he said, man called Jesus, made some mud, put it in my eye, sent me.
me to the pond. I rinsed off. I did exactly what he told me to, to do, and now I can see. And notice something very important here. He doesn't try to be a theologian here. He doesn't try to explain what happened. He just simply states the fact. They said, well, where is this man? He says, I don't know. He didn't try to answer questions that he did not know, have an answer for. And many people uh, don't want to share their story, again, because they're afraid they're going to be asked questions that they can't answer. Well, what about suffering? Well, what about dinosaurs? Well, what came first, the chicken or the egg? It's okay to say, you know what? I don't have a clue. I'm clueless. I'm clueless in Bradenton. I don't know. It's okay. A second time, they summon the, bl the blind man and they say, okay, <clears throat> we, know this man, this we know this man is a sinner. And look at what he says. I love this guy's honesty. He, he replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. All this theological stuff, I don't know. Here's what I do know. I was blind, but now I see. And there's a lot of stuff I don't know. And what I do know is what God has done in my life. And it's really important for us to, to get a hold of. When you're sharing with people, man, just learn to ask, ask questions, answer uh, their questions as, as best as you can. And sometimes you got to say, you know what, I don't know. But there is something I do know. I know what Jesus Christ has done in my life. And, you know, I want to encourage us to begin to, to think about what God has done in your life so that you'd be prepared at the right time to give an account. You don't have to tell people everything, but you just simply need to, to give an account. And you don't have to, you know, you may say, well, I grew up in a church. Every single one of us has a testimony. And what we need to look at is, okay, what difference has Jesus made in my life? You could look at, you know, hey, before I was, uh, I was saved, man, I was on a self-destructive path with, with drugs and alcohol. And today I'm healthy. I'm making good choices because of Jesus. Hey, I was so filled with guilt because of my sins. I had a dark cloud over me, but today I'm walking in forgiveness, and, and, and I, I'm a free person today. Hey, before I was so fearful. I was so fearful of death. Now today I walk in a peace of God knowing that I have a home waiting for me in, the etern in eternity. We are all in the witness business. Remember, we're not the judge. We're not pronouncing judgment on anybody. We're not prosecuting anybody. We're not a defense attorney. We're a witness to simply tell people what Jesus has done in our life. Nobody is an expert in your life. Nobody can argue what God has done in your life. Again, listen, answer questions the best way you know how. If you don't know the answer, just tell them. Just say, hey, I'll find out. And you tell them, hey, it's not about joining the church. It's about a relationship with Jesus. We all have a story. Be willing to share it. And Bible tells us as we share it in such a fashion that doesn't turn people off, God will begin to move in people's lives. Here's number three. The results are up to God. You do your part, and God will do his part. You just expect God to work on your behalf. When you think about it, the most important thing for you when it comes to evangelism is just simply being obedient, simply being faithful. Faithful is more important than results. You just be faithful to step out and just say, God, I want to make myself available to be used by you. Picture it this way. You are a link in somebody's spiritual journey. That's why I love what we're doing. Uh, you know, and, and where I'm going with this is we may not be that person that sees that person come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. But you may be that person that moves that person closer to a relationship with God. That's why I love what we're doing in the community. I envision when we're going to Bayshore, when we're going to Moody, when we're going to college campus, we're sowing seeds of God's love. Do you follow what I'm saying? And, and maybe, maybe there's a family that we gave a, a backpack to this past Monday night. And maybe they had a really bad experience with a Christian or a church. And they have a wall built up towards Christianity. And all of a sudden, they have an encounter with one of our volunteers. And they say, hey, listen, I, uh, you know, we just want to bless your family. God bless you. And we're going to be praying for you. And all of a sudden, they walk, uh, you know, uh, they walk out of Bayshore and just say, you know what? Those Christians aren't that bad. And all of a sudden, that wall comes down a little more. 
they have an encounter with somebody that loves Jesus at work, and that person shows them an act of kindness, all of a sudden that, that wall comes down a little farther. Can I catch, a, catch the picture? We may be a link in moving somebody closer to their relationship with God. And I've seen this happen many times in my life, in the church's life. You be faithful and you expect God to do his part, and he'll do that. And it really takes pressure off us when you really think about it. It's not our job to close the deal. It's God's job. I want to read to you an important passage found in 1 Corinthians 3, 6. This is the Apostle Paul, greatest evangelist ever. Listen to what he says. My work was to plant the seed in your hearts. And Apollos' work was to water it. And it still wasn't done yet. Listen to what it goes on. It says, but it was God, not we, who made the garden grow in your heart. So what's Paul saying, man? We just have to be faithful. We just have to do our part. And God will do the other part. So number four, go for the invite. Invite people to a place where they can have a face-to-face encounter with God. We should change our language from weekend services to weekend experiences because it's really about encountering God. In fact, Jesus isn't a religion, but he's a person. He's not someone to be understood. He's someone to encounter, someone to experience. When people come here for for a weekend service, we don't want them to experience And the institution of a church, we want them to experience the presence of God. And, you know, when you look at Paul, Paul was a skeptic. He was killing and persecuting Christians. He was a Pharisee. He was convinced they were a cult that needed to be eliminated. Then he has an encounter with God. And in 1 Corinthians, he's telling telling believers how he's going to to, uh, um, share the message. 1 Corinthians 2, this is message translation. I love this. It says, you'll remember, friends, that when I first came to you to let you in on God's master stroke, I didn't try to impress you with polished speeches and the latest philosophy. I deliberately kept it plain and simple. First Jesus and who he is, then Jesus and what he did, Jesus crucified. I was unsure of how to go about this and felt totally inadequate. inadequate. I was scared to death. If you want the truth of it, and so nothing I said could have impressed you or anyone else. Then he gives us the how. He said, but the message came through anyway. God's spirit, God's power did it. The, the, the word power in the Greek comes from a word uh, pneuma, and it means breath of fresh air. And Paul is saying, you know what? I can't see it, but it's there. It's something to experience. It's something to encounter. And he goes on to say, which made it clear that your life of faith is a response to God's power. Paul is saying it's not about responding to the best argument about Jesus. It's responding to something much bigger than that. Something much bigger than it goes on to say, not some fancy mental or emotional footwork by me or anyone else. I want to encourage you to invite them to a place where they can experience God. You know, our last Get Connected luncheon, which was just a few weeks ago, there was a a first time guest there, a little old lady, a little grandmother type, white hair, and just as kind and gentle as she could be. We get we give people an opportunity to share. She talked about how that service was her first service at Church of the Cross. And then she went on to say how this one song spoke to her. And she talked about how every single word that came came from the stage from that song was the exact word she needed for what she was going through that day. And at that season in her life. Can I tell you something? She experienced God through that song, through the worship team. I can't tell you how many times I've I've shared on a Sunday morning, people uh, cornered me afterwards and said, hey, pastor, it was like me and you were in one room and you were talking directly to me. Can I tell you something? They were experiencing God through the message. I've had people tell me, man, man, when when I came to Church of the Cross, I have never felt so loved and accepted by a church in all my life. 
Can I tell you something? They experienced God through their interaction with you guys. You were being Jesus to those people. And maybe you're here today and, and you're trying to figure it all out. There's no pressure to do anything. I just want to encourage you just to experience God. Many people don't need an explanation. They just simply need to be invited to, to have an encounter with God. So, so let's serve people. Let's meet people's practical needs. Let's add value whenever we can to show them the love of God. Let's look for opportunities to tell them our story and at the right time, invite them to, uh, to experience God in a face-to-face -face encounter. And we do everything on our weekend to, to really mix it up. We try to have series that comes along you and direct it at you to help you grow. That's what this series was about this summer. We asked you at Easter time. What is it that you need us to talk about to help you grow? And so that's what this ser series is about. The next few series is going to be a great series for you to invite people. So next week we're going to be do doing core. We're going to be asking, uh, the, answering the question, why love God? Why why love others? Why serve the world? Then we're going to follow that up by a series on hope. We live in a crazy world right now. But in the midst of the craziness, we can experience hope through Jesus Christ. And it's a very timely series, so that would be a great series to ask, to, to ask people to come to. Then we're going to be doing a relationship series along with a relationship conference. So we have plenty of opportunities coming down the pike to invite people. I want to encourage you to step into that, begin to ask God now, God, who is it that you want me to invite to, to experience you um, in, uh, in these coming weeks? You know, a lot of times people will not cross that line with God because they have wrong information in their head about God. I remember growing up when I was real young, I had wrong information about my dad. Okay, I, I know it's hard to believe, but when I would get in trouble when I was like three or four, real small, um, I remember my mom, she would tower over me, she would be pointing her finger and say, man, <clears throat> you just wait until your father gets home. When I tell him at dinner what you've done, he is going to hit the ceiling. And I'm a visual learner, okay? And that's how, I mean, that's why I tell a lot of stories and word pictures and stuff like that. That's how I learn and that's how I teach. And so in my mind, I just had this picture of me sitting at the dinner table, my mom telling my mom whatever I did, flush the kid, uh, the cat down the toilet or whatever, um, and, and expecting my dad's head to pop off of his head like a cartoon character, hit the ceiling, come back down. I was always disappointed because that's never what I, that's never that never happened. But in my mind, my little warped mind at three or four years old, I had the wrong information. But a lot of times people have the wrong information about God. They may believe the lie that, you know what, I can't, I can't ever please God, so why even try to? Well, I want to give you just three misconceptions about God, three barriers that people have. I'm just going to quickly move through them. Number one is God's not interested in, in me. He's too big. He's too busy. He's too far away for him to be interested in me. And I'll tell you, for the longest time, I grew up with that same concept, man. I, I, I never questioned whether God existed, but I was thinking, man, God is too busy, man. He's got the universe to run. He's got world affairs. He doesn't even know I exist. That couldn't be so, couldn't be further from the truth. He's not far away. He's very near. He doesn't play. Good news is he doesn't play hide and seek with us. The Bible says as we draw close to God, he will in turn draw close to us. Here's the second one. I've got to get my act together. And a lot of times people have this mindset as they look at God, they, they kind of look at baggage. They got so much baggage in their life that somehow they got to lose some of this baggage before they have a relationship with God. And you've heard people say this, you know, hey, you know what, man, if I go to your church, man, the rafters okay then. You know, that's the, that's the mindset of that. They've got to somehow clean their act up before they have a relationship with God. But that's why we have a Savior. We're messed up. We need a Savior. And I can't tell you how many times I've had this conversation with, with people. Hey, I know God forgives me, but I can't forgive myself. Well, I want to tell you, it's a myth that, that God doesn't want you. Because God has much compassion, God has much mercy, has much love, and much grace to extend to us. No matter where you are at, God desperately loves you. Romans 5.8 says that, but God shows us his great love for us in this way. Christ died for us while we were still sinners. 
And I love the fact that he, went, he didn't wait until see if we're going to receive him first and then die. You follow what I'm saying? It's like easier to die for somebody you know that, that loves you, you know? But while they were spitting on him and mocking him and taking him to the cross, what was his response? Father, I'll pay for this. While they were beating him, torturing him, while he's hanging on Calvary, he was saying, Father, I'll pay for that also. Why did he do it that way? To show his great love for you and I. Here's the last one. I've got to earn it. Man, I've got to work for it. I've got to get on God's good side. You can get there, but you've got to work for it. And many mind people think, okay, I know I've got to pray more. I know I, know I need to go to church uh, more often than I do. I know I need to tithe. I need to serve the church. I need to get involved in a small group. And a lot of times people have this myth or they, have, they look at God through the lenses of works. Well, Jesus made it very clear. He hit this head on in John 6, 28 and 29. The people asked Jesus, what are the things God wants us to do? Jesus answered, the work God wants you to do is this. Believe the one he sent. Believe, put your faith in. Man, put your trust in, put your hope in. God is saying, give me your life. Believe in a one who is sent. And some of you say, well, I've read the verses, ma'am, Stan. I read the verses where, you know, faith without works is nothing. That's after you get saved. I want you to know there are, there's a lot of things that God wants us to accomplish in this life. But it's not because we're trying to earn his favor. You know what? Friday I spent the day working outside, cutting my grass, trimming hedges, trimming the lawn and everything. And I want you to know, I didn't mow it. I didn't mow the grass. I didn't work in my yard to get my wife to love me. Okay, I mowed the grass because it was high. Okay, we do stuff around here not to get God to like us. He already likes us. He already loves us. We do it because people need the life-giving message of Jesus Christ. And God doesn't have a plan B. We're it. God has entrusted us with the life-giving message of Jesus Christ. We are it. And I just want to close with this. It's a free gift that God wants to, to give you. God wants you to pass on to other people. We can't buy it. We can't earn it. We can't work for it. It's absolutely free. That's why it's so precious. And that's why we need to, to be about God's business and sharing it with other people. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, I mean that you have been saved by grace through believing. You did not save yourself. It was a gift from God. It was not the result of your own efforts. So you cannot brag about it. And then Romans 6.23 says this, the payment for sin is death, but God gives us the free gift of life forever in Christ Jesus our Lord. What a good God we serve. Amen. Let's just bow our heads and pray right now. God, we pray.